The end of the quarter is here. Let's get ready for the fourth quarter. Today's video is going to be different than our normal top 10. I'm going to run through the global markets, indexes. I'm going to show you some of the proprietary scans that I actually use using charting software. And I'm also going to go through a list of the top traded stocks for the past nine months. And also we're going to look at the global economies a little bit here. We're going to look at the debt market, the bond market, and try to get an understanding of all the sectors and what's going out. And we're going to look at this on a monthly basis. The time of recording this is when we had third quarter just wrap up. And so this is a good time for us to kind of get into it. Subscribe to the channel, click all notifications. In the description, there will be uh, slides to correlate with what's going on here. So you'll have levels that you can look at and utilize. Now, we're just gonna start here. We're gonna look at monthly charts. This is Tesla. Great spot to start because it's one of the most active stocks. And what I'm gonna suggest that you do is that you put in a 10 month moving average. If you use a 10 month moving average, it gives you an understanding, gives you a slope, gives you a nice period of time where you can start seeing if the trend is changing. I would just point something out that from where we started the month off about December before the pandemic to where you are now, you really did not have a declining slope on this. And it is somewhat telling that Tesla is having a very hard time getting through that 10 month moving average. So this is the first thing you might want to remember just when you look at monthly charts. And what we're doing here is we're getting a long term assessment of what's going on in the market. Okay. So with something like Tesla, you start seeing a point down like this. It's very hard uh, to get there and to become a uh, bullish looking at this chart right now. You can see the downward slope as well. We're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. So here we are. Here is the S&P. You can see the slope. What did we do? We got right to that 10 month moving average. I'm going to recommend that you put this in all your charts. What did you do? This is where you closed on the month. This is not ideal. You closed at the low of the month. It's not ideal at all. It's not setting up properly. We're going to get into the dollar and UK and some of the exchanges of value versus growth. I'm going to give a couple uh, correlations that I use as to what's going on here. But you need to look at this. I mean, you're at 356.80. You're bouncing your head right along this level. If that breaks, where do you go to? And I, I think the easiest way for you to come up with some level of assessment is take peak to take a look at the trough during the pandemic. And you can kind of see where you're lying in here. So if you break this 356, you know, a retracement of the 38.6 level gets you to about 317, 320. It's not an exact science, but there's nothing redeeming about this. Taking a look at the Dow, the great thing about having this 10 month in this line, it just really gives you the slope. So not only are you below your 10 month, which is pretty rare for you to be, we're talking about pandemic levels or maybe some, you know, some kind of anomaly like we had in 2018, but it's this slope that should really just be raising everyone's eyebrows. Now, let's just be real clear about this with the slope. You could bounce up 15% and still have a declining 10 month. So we are talking about long term trajectories on what is happening here. And you can clearly see 10 month is rolling. We're pulling down. If you really go back all the way, you really have to go to the great financial crisis. Right. And that's kind of how we're trading right now, as if something like that is out there. And you can see that even during 15, 16, we kind of went sideways to down a little bit, but nothing to the degree that you're seeing right now. And you have to go back even further to find it again. 2001, 2002, and you can see it there. But overall, this is not ideal long term and something we want to keep our eyes on. Now, this is crude oil futures. We've been trying to get over that 80 level. I'm just going to mark off a couple levels here for you to look at. You can see that 80, 81 level, and we crack that. Now, now oil has been down for four months in a row, and we are below that 10 month moving average, which we've only really done that once in the past year, year and a half. I'm still pretty bearish on oil here. I don't really understand the mechanics on why we're seeing it come in so hard. I don't know if it's based upon uh, the slowdown that everyone is expecting to go on, but we still have sanctions and we still have some issues, but it is pretty rare for uh, for us to be below this. And you really haven't seen this type of decline uh, since we were back here in 2014. So now 
if you dig into gold futures and just take a look at what's going on there, they're holding up a little bit better. They're not holding up ideal. But if you go out about 10 years, take a look at that line, you can see that 117.98 level, right? And you try to get over it that 1800 every time you're met by these two rejections right here so it's very clear that up top here you have your major resistance right you can see people are not really going to get too excited about being up there and now you're starting to crack and that's what that's what i'm taking away from this so i have this range for about two years and i've cracked it so i wouldn't be surprised to start seeing this start rolling and I know that some of these uh, names, these miners are absolutely destroyed and gold has come in, but I think that this is setting up to come in a little bit more. So that's why I like running these scans. I'm running them live as we're talking. Uh, it's not rehearsed because I can look at this and go, okay, well, this is definitely a sector uh, towards the end of the year that, that could have some issues here. And I'd recommend that you uh, bookmark this video and I'll have the chapters marked off eventually where you can go through it and just look at the timestamps. But this is very telling when you have two wicks like this here's your your baseline and you cracked so that's really hard to rule out until you get back over that 1735 i would be pretty bearish on gold here silver's already cracked right so there's not really much there's not much meat on the bone here with silver uh, i would be telling you to look at gold a little bit more we're going to leave this 10 month moving average in but you can see how that 18 could be support and you're really back, back down the pandemic levels Compare that to gold and, you know, you look at where you were at pandemic levels on gold and you're nowhere near there. So you have there are a lot of room for that to fall. Now, this is the European financial sector. And based upon what's going on, this is always a really good one to look at. It doesn't really move anywhere or hasn't moved anywhere over the past 10 years. But let's just put this in perspective. You have one huge base, except when you had a pandemic, right? But what we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a pattern. When this starts to break that 10 month, what happens? It stays down for multiple months and that's what's happening here. Now, this 1364 level seems to be support and there's only really been one time since we've broken this, but we are aware of what's going on out there, right? We are aware of the fact that Credit Suisse is having a little bit of issues right now. Uh, they're talking about selling things to meet debt payments. Deutsche Bank is going to have issues because of that. We know it's going on in the UK. So we know how all that spreads. So the symbol for this one is EUFN. I'd strongly recommend that you watch it. Uh, if you start breaking down to this 1364 and you start getting into those pandemic levels, there's no supply here. There's nobody that is going to be holding on to this. So you could really see the European banks come in a little harder. Now, this is US broker dealer securities. This is a really good understanding of what's going on at Goldman, what's going on under the hood of our brokers, right? I think it's a great way to understand how healthy the market actually is. And right now it's not very healthy. So you can just see the trajectory and how it changed. You can see how we're pointing down again. Look, rejection over rejection symbol is IAI rejection over rejection. And you can just see how we're coming straight down here. And we're having a hard time for those that are just listening on audio. What you're going to want to watch your broker dealers is you're going to want to make sure that you hold that 8044 level. 8044 is what you're going to want to try to hold on to there. If you crack that, you're going to complete this multi month H pattern, which probably gets you down to some kind of breakout level, which could be around $62. That is going to be really deadly for the Goldman's and the JP Morgan's and Jeffries of the world. So watch this level because this could be setting up some good short opportunities here. And this can happen fast. It doesn't have to take very long. What's going to happen are things like the socks that have already just gotten decimated. So if you take a look at the, the uh, semiconductor index and where you're at right now, just you're down 43 percent from the top. So these names have already gotten washed out. To some extent, could they go lower? Absolutely. If you take a look at this, the stocks closed at the low and took out the recent low. Very little to say there, very little redeeming. Now we are going into historically one of the best seasons ever in the market, fourth quarter midterms. Historically, you see numbers around 16.6% .6 during this period of time versus fourth quarter usually being, uh, I think it's something like 16.6% .6 for the next 12 months going into midterms versus 6.6% .6 for the next 12 months. It's pretty substantial. But if you take a look at what the SOX is saying right here, 
it's cracked. So technically, I can I can look at all that data I want, but I need to look at this chart and what this chart's telling me. This chart, chart's telling me that we're going lower. So we have to respect the risk, and we all saw how the market acted today. And we have to think that we could get down to that 270 level, and what is that going to do to NVIDIA? What's that going to do to those stocks? How far down would they come? And we're going to cover NVIDIA later uh, today on a monthly basis. Actually, you know what? Let's just do it right now so it's all linked together. So if you take a look at NVIDIA, this was our target price in the trading community. Trading community is open. Uh, and there is a link in the description and there'll be a link at the end of the video. And actually I'll put one up right here right now uh, as well. So if you could just see this 115.66 level, right? And you're holding that, but this is a bare flag. I mean, this is, this is put, put this in a textbook. So it's, it's right there. I mean, it doesn't get any cleaner, right? Here's your flagpole, here's your flag you broke. It's on. So it's very difficult uh, to look at this and say that you should be bullish on semiconductors. I understand the data and I understand that we are talking about, you know, fourth quarter, we usually move, you know, maybe we're going to flush here before we go higher. That's kind of how, what we're setting up for. Now we can always make plans and we don't know what's going to happen. But this is pretty substantial when you start seeing gap downs on major stocks like this. And you know, for those that are just listening, you can see a, there's a gap right in the chart in the video that's taking you down. So you know, your last hold is really going to be this 2021 level, right? And that's what roughly 115.67. If you kind of just take a look at the top on where you were before the pandemic and then you rolled back down, it gets you to $73. So can this get to $73? Yes, it can. Uh, you know, I always like to go back and just remind people that here is Cisco on a monthly basis. And I've been around for about 20 years trading, a little over 20 years. And one of the key things is here you are, here's Cisco. This was 20 years ago. If you said you were going to hold it, you're still down half 22 years later. So you have to ask yourself if that's what you want to be doing, right? It's probably not the best idea in the world. So here you are with what's going on with industrials. And do we see anything different here? We really don't. What, what we're seeing is the same pattern, same soup reheated over and over again. And what we're going to do is just mark these levels off. So this 84.81 was a line in the sand on the industrials. You rallied through the 10-month moving average, which you now know to use on all your charts. And you can see how we sliced right through that and broke down. What stocks are these? This is the Boeings of the world, okay? This is your Honeywell right? They're the kinds of names that are going to be affected by this coming in. And you can see how we're pointing down and the sloping and trajectory. We really haven't seen anything like this since the pandemic. And quite frankly, we're going to have to go back to the great financial crisis again. So if, if, if we don't go through a great financial crisis, and if we don't go through something close to the pandemic, it's safe to say that this stuff's underpriced. It's safe to say that unless we go through an event like that, then maybe it's not. So it, the market's trading a little bit like something's out there. I just think we have to take note of that. But one actual bright spot today was biotech. And you can see here, this is pretty fascinating stuff because here you are during your pandemic levels at $63, $62.94 to be exact. And that level of $62.94, we've bounced off of twice already in May and April, and we held. We've challenged that 10 day a couple times and we've been under that, or I'm sorry, 10 month. Uh, we've been under it for almost, what, a year right now since November. So you're coming up on a year under it. That's a pretty long time to be under the 10 month. Historically, if you look at the charting system, even during 2015-16, uh, which was not an ideal time for biotech, if you go back and take a look at it, 2009, you never really made it under this for a year. So not only do we want to look at the level, we want to look at the historical data and say, hey, what other period in time have we really been under this moving average for more than 12 months? And you can actually even argue that it started back here in May of 2021. It's been more than 12 months. And the answer is not many times. We have once that's kind of close, but not really. So this shows me that even though we're pointing down trajectory, we are bouncing off a level and we could possibly be washed out of biotech is what this is telling me. So that might be something for us to consider. 
I find this fascinating. This is the XLP consumer staples on the monthly. You just cracked. So when the market actually does come in, they take everybody with them. They, there, there, is no, there, there is no shelter. So everything will come down, everything. Nothing will be safe. I, I, I don't know how to be any clearer about that. So people will can park in the coal gates and the, uh, you know, the, the Procter and Gambles and the Cloroxes of the world, but when they crack and the, they crack the market, meaning when they drop the market, they all drop. I find it interesting that this is dropping now and this probably had the worst month that it's had in probably two years since the pandemic and you're really starting to break here. This might be a sign that they're raising cash. And if they're raising cash out of XLP, where do they plan on putting it? They might be looking to put it in some of the more beaten down areas like the XBI that we just went through. So that's something to consider as well. And these are shares of telecommunications companies. And this has just got you know d disaster written all over it. Let's just zoom out on this a little bit so you can see where you're at. And you can kind of go back all the way to 2000. So I, I, I'm i not going to go back any further, but just look at this, okay? You can see that triple top at 3474 for those that are just listening. Uh, symbols IYZ, uh, US telecommunication ETF shares. So if you come across here, you can see we broke a major multi-year support this month. So we have just broken the 2440 level, and that is a level that was at one point resistance back in May 2011, and then support in 15 and support during the pandemic. And we just sliced through it like a hot knife through butter. So that means that we could probably come down to, you know, maybe this 12, right? Maybe we can get down that level. Well, let's say you can't get to 12. Let's say you can get to the 1628 level. These are two support levels that you're setting up for. And you can also go back to 2002, 2003, if you must. And that puts you at 14. So that's going to give us a range on where we're going to be at, right? Because you have three, three very strong spots. So you could find support in there in this range. And that's pretty significant, right? So if you know that there's some support down here, but where does that get you? Well, that's still down another 20%. 20%, AT&T, Verizon, they're, they're gonna come in. If the, if the index and sector is gonna come in that hard, they're really gonna come in. Now we're gonna look at this in a correlation very shortly. This is TLT, the 20 year. It, it just doesn't get any uglier. And we were doing okay and we were starting to make some level of progress. And then we saw what the, the intervention happened in the UK. I think that was more confusing to everybody, quite frankly, than anything else. Maybe it maybe it's trying to put a bottom in there, but at this 102.45 level, you, know, you start looking back on where you're at and you have support at 101.63. If you break 101.63, which you did not close below, you know, you're gonna break that 100 barrier. You break the 100 barrier, we're looking at this 88 level. That's that's not ideal. So people that are along the 20 year bond are looking at a possible drop of another 13, 14%. That's not really where you want to be. So people keep saying, well, do you think it's time to buy bonds? I, I don't. I don't think it's time to buy bonds. I think that the Fed is going to completely and grossly overshoot. And we're going to, I'm going to get to some of that a little bit later, but there's a ton to cover. And as I said, we're going to cover a lot here in a very short period of time. So this is Deutsche Bank, and I just really want to point this out. So here we are on the monthly close. And I just want to go to this monthly close. So you're at 740. So just so we're clear on this entire chart, since this has been around, since 2000, you have only closed once at this level. It was during the great pandemic. Right. And when that pandemic hit, that's when you closed your next spot. If you break this level, you're looking at five dollars on on Deutsche Bank. So this is not ideal by any stretch and something that you we really need to pay attention to. I thought we might bounce at some point, but with what's going on, on over in Europe, there's there's a lot of issues. So I would continue to avoid these. If you take a look at Microsoft. Again, here you are. Look at your declining 10 month moving average. If you see that moving average and you see the decline, you're going to have to kind of look in here and go, well, where could we hold? Well, we got we are in that pandemic level of 232 and we kind of closed on that 232 and we held that 232.90 a couple times, didn't we? 
right? One, two, three. So we held there three times and we rejected it here, four, right? And now it's support. So if that breaks, then you have to assume that you have to look at this monthly flag. Let's just go to the bottom part of that monthly flag. That takes you 196. So if 232.86 breaks, 196 is on the table. Can that happen? Yes. And it can happen faster than you think it can. So something to think about. And you might want to just remember those levels. Google, I, I, I'm foaming at the mouth to buy this stock because of its cash flow. But when you look at what's going on here on the monthly, and we can see the 10 month, which you're all going to use now in your charts, when you start looking at monthly, keep this in mind. You might want to actually look at this watch list and, and, and create your own. Some of the proprietary ones that we're going to go over a little bit later, it's going to be hard for you to to calculate on your own, but uh, I'm gonna go over them and give them to you anyway. So here you are with Google and you can see what's happening here. Perfect bear flag on the monthly and you broke. It's not debatable. Uh, up here is where I was really looking at trying to buy some leaps and then just decided against it. I wanted to click clear this long leg doji and it just didn't do it. And here you are, now you broke down and you have to see what's going on. 92.31 is major support for those that are listening. 92.31 on Google on the monthly. That's what I would focus on. Now, you need to look at everything when you're looking at the end of the quarter, end of the month. And you're gonna see some things that you're probably not used to seeing. You might not always look at Exxon, but you wanna know what's going on with Exxon at, at all times. Okay? They are the behemoth. So if we take a look at this, we can see a sector that is pretty pretty much hanging in there, right? So $60 oil, $80 oil, is, is it gonna matter? Yeah, it'll matter to some extent to Exxon, but the theme here is what stock is above its 10 month moving average? Which one has been riding it since the pandemic? Well, that would be Exxon. Exxon actually touched the 10 month moving average of a low of 83.89 this month and bounced off of it. So we would know now that if we break that 83.89 level that this might be in jeopardy since it's not something we have closed below since the pandemic. And that might be something we wanna pay attention to. We know that major support since, but what, 2008 now? You have that 96.12, it was major support for a little bit and broke and now it is major resistance. And we tried one, two, three, four, five times to get through it and were unable to. So keep that on your radar. And this is what I'm talking about, right? Verizon, this is exactly what we just were talking about. Make sure you subscribe to the channel because there's gonna be updates to this as the, uh, as, as the end of the quarter gets there. I think I'm gonna run this monthly for people so they can really focus on this and understand how to start developing a longer term thesis instead of the, just the day to day minutia. Some people seem to be really getting caught up in it. So I think this might be helpful. 4280 was something that you broke. And for those that are just simply listening to this, you may wanna just check out the uh, YouTube channel. So, but if you see right here and look at this 4280 broke, and once you cracked, what happened? That became resistance. Now what do you have? Nothing. You have you have very little. You have a wick at $38, $38.06 that you just broke. So when you start looking at where you can get to, you have to start looking at where the next wick is, right? Because that's really where you had the buyer step in. That's $32.28 on Verizon. So Verizon is setting itself up for a lot more pain. And if that's not something that interests you when you look at AT&T and you see AT&T at 15 34 and you go back and take a look at these wicks from 2008 and you realize that you broke it you, you are through 2008 levels you have to go back to 2002 this is always what gets me about people when they talk about oh just dollar cost average in your stocks well if your stock's declining and selling assets in order to pay its dividend you probably don't want a dollar cost average into it so you're probably going to get to that 1474 level if you break that which Candidly, I'm just going to be blunt. I think you do because there's a there's a dividend cut that's eventually going to have to come here, and you can see this declining move the whole way down. If you see something like this, you don't want to be involved. You want to be on the short side, and we went through the index. So if you're not interested in shorting Verizon or AT and T, the move might just be to short that entire sector and get exposure that way and not have single stock risk. J P Morgan, you you have to focus on obviously from from the banking sector, and we looked at 
the broker dealer group and obviously that's in there but you're seeing the same pattern everywhere you're seeing these little h's and then you're breaking you're unable to rally over resistance points 119.33 seems to be the stock's nemesis so we're kind of setting up to retest the pandemic levels and support is at that $94 range. So we're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on this. I don't see any hurry to be rushing in here to be buying these banking stocks. Uh, at the time of recording this, I am currently short uh, the, the, entire in, the entire sector. So GDX, so we look at the gold miners and this was somewhat interesting because the gold miners actually might be getting washed out. So you have these periods where you just stay under for multiple years, right? And maybe that continues, maybe it doesn't. But now I have this doji that's forming right at the 23 line where we broke out during the pandemic when everybody wanted to own gold. When the pandemic hit, everybody wanted to be in gold and for whatever reason. But uh, so that 23 seems to be holding here. So I, I would watch this. I'd watch this a little closer and see how we act at that 23. And maybe we can flip the 25 and three quarters. And maybe you could push up there. We're going to go over... Uh, Newmont Mining, we might as well do it right now and take a look at Newmont so that we can see what's going on there and you see the same kind of pattern. So is Newmont washed out? Well, we've been in this range now for a period of time. You have these long, long monthly so sell bars, right? And then we have a short stubby one, which lets us know that they're kind of getting exhausted. Then you flip, now you have this little doji, wonky bar, and it's green for the first time in five months. Well, that's an interesting spot. So, you know, we held that 40 level. So as long as we hold 40 and could use that as a particular level, right? If we could use that as a possible stop and you're looking at that 4460 as a particular buy, if you were looking long-term to own these names, there is nothing about this chart that's telling you it's gonna go right up right now. What I'm simply saying is, if you are a long-term investor, we're trying to get a sense of it, this may be washed out, Newmont might, be washed out but there's there's a tremendous amount going on out there and we're going to really dive right into some of these other names and, and so you understand the whole space before you you do that but I, I would be looking for things like this and just seeing like hey if this gets washed out uh is this something that i want to go near so if you take a look at the dax uh, you've just completely and utterly broken down there's very little to do here with the dax just completely avoid it uh, at this point. I'm, I'm surprised that they haven't gotten it together over there yet, but uh, they just really don't seem to have an entire plan for winter. Um, and it just seems like they uh, just keep pushing it off a little bit. I don't know really what the, what the game plan is there. And I think it's just weighing on the stock and the financial situation is weighing on it too. So if you break that level here and you break that 20, you're going to be a teenager. Uh, on the DAX and you, you, the pandemic low was 17. Maybe you get there. Maybe there's another 10% drop in the DAX, which will really hurt Deutsche Bank and take it through $5 probably this time around. If we look at the financials, this was the one sector I really wanted to see hold on here. And the reason was because this is where you were at during the great uh, real estate market that started in like 03 all the way through to 07. And then you can kind of see what you know, where you bounced in January 2020. This was a really pivotal level. Uh, when we cracked, this is one of the areas where I just said, you know what, this makes perfect spot to actually short this. That's broken. There's very little to say about this. And uh, this is a pretty clear shooting star right against that 10-month moving average that you're, of course, going to put in all your monthly charts now. And you can see how you broke right here. And now look where you closed. I mean, that's nasty. This is day one. If you get a lower low next week, which very well could be the case, and we'll get into why I think that in a moment here, but you're gonna have some issues. So keep that on your radar. Now, here you are with the consumer discretionary space, and you can see same thing, but not as bad as you saw in financial. So something for us definitely to consider. Now, look at utilities. Now, utilities are trying to hang in there. At least you're in an upward slope. Let's see if these can hold in, but just like XLP, they are selling and dumping utilities. And this is probably one of the worst closes you've had in utilities in over 12 months. So that is telling. Are they raising capital? Do they think that bond yields are going higher? We're going to cover the 10 year in a moment here, and we're going to look at the 30 as well in a little bit. But it's definitely something for us to think about, right? 
here's here's the real estate market's falling off a cliff. Uh, you know, one of the names that made a lot of sense to take a look at shorting was REM, and I'll just show you this. Uh, it is residential mortgages uh, from iShares, and you're just falling right off a cliff. Beautiful H. You're probably going back to pandemic levels, which would put this at 13. So there's probably an extra 40% there. I, I just don't see that the, the the mortgage industry doing well. Even if even if the hold build, home builders hold there because of lack of supply, I just don't see how this is REM is going to possibly hold in there. So, but if you drill into the 10 year and you look at this on a, and we're going to do this on a decade basis. So if you just kind of take a look at this and you realize that since 1981, which by the way, was the last time that CPI was higher than the 10 year. Just if you go back and look at your historical data, it's the same exact situation you're in right now. You flip 322, right? So now you can see your DTL or what we refer to as downward trend line. You can see how you locked in right here on 18, 2018, 322. They tried to flip it, right? You can see this flip. Let's zoom in on that, this now. And you can see that right there, right? So then you come across, you flip, and then you break down. And now you're going to go here and you're going to take a look and what happened now we banged our head against 405 now with what the uk is doing by buying bonds it's possible that they slow down the rate and selling of us bonds that is possible so we do have to take that little macro thing into account but you get above 405 this thing's going to rip so is this the time to be buying bonds no i think you need to see this settle in I mean, you have a 10 day that's screaming up and you just broke through a DTL and you have confirmation this month that you just broke through the DTL, right? You always need to pop up and over for that confirmation. IEF is the seven and 10 year treasury bond. Okay, the other was the yield. This is price. Does this look like something that you would buy? It's an, it's an absolute complete free fall. And you have no support here. There's very, very little support. Again, for very specific slides, uh, most likely the proprietary ones. There will be a link in description. Simply click in there uh, and you will have them sent to your email. So let's just keep on going. Now, Apple monthly. Very little to say here. When was the last time we were closing below the 10 month? The very last time we were closing below the 10 month was 2018. We didn't even close below the 10 month during the pandemic. Before then, you didn't close below it until it was 2015. So if you look at where you're at now and you know what this pattern is, which is an evening star pattern, you are completely breaking down here and you closed at the lows. I don't see how this is holding here, but there is a support line right in here that you should be able to see. And for those that are just listening, I'm going to pop it right in there. And it's that 136.90. So if you can hold 136.90, if you can hold 136.90, maybe you could hold here. But to me, this looks like it's it's got some real issues ahead of it, and we might be in for more pain before the bounce. Now, reminder, the pain can come fast on these names, and then you can just turn right around. Now, NVIDIA, we talked about, and we do feel that way about it, that you can get to that 73 level still if you break that 115. I remember talking to someone about this uh, a year ago on Twitter, on social media, and they're like, well, th this will never get to that level again. I I've been around for a while, and the reason I'm doing these on a long-term chart, and I'm going to do this more, uh, people need to understand that there are levels you're never going to see again. Okay, It is quite possible NVIDIA never sees this level again. And that's just something that people are going to have to reconcile with. If we can go back and look at the Cisco's of the world. Now, the VIX, the VIX, this 3252 level, we just cannot close over it. And that's really what you need. You need this huge spike up and we are just not getting it. We're just not getting that fear. And if you go back and take a look historically on what causes these bottoms to form, it's fear. And during the great financial crisis, what, what did we get up to? 90, 89? I mean, it's insanity. What did we get up to during the pandemic, which was a very scary time for all of us? 85? Right now we're at 30. It's like, eh, what's the hurry? And, and that's an issue. 
you need, you need to see that fear until you do, you have a problem. And, and it's definitely something we have, should focus on. So this is just micro caps and you can see that nothing is really safe right now. You have that same exact pattern with the shooting star. This one was green, but you broke, closed at a low. And I would just be avoiding micro caps as well. We should probably look at Goldman and you can see this pattern, right? So once again, you got to the 10 month, you rejected it. Everybody knows to leave these on their charts now. You open there and now you closed at a new low. You closed at a low that you have not seen since, wow. I mean, it's been a while since you've been here, since you've had a close like this, right? You haven't had this since January. So you're at about a 16, 17 month close. That's a, that's a problem and something that you're gonna have to watch. If you were looking for your major support level, uh, it looks like it's 275 that you need to hold there. So hopefully we hold that level. Now, in regards to uh, hedged equity funds that are out of Europe, it's important to understand what's going on there because it's all connected right now you're rolling just the same. You have a bear flag, that flag's breaking down, and it just, it just does not look ideal. Um, you know, as far as going through the technology index, it's like beating a dead horse after looking at the socks. We already know. I would want to just point something out. If Look at KRE, and KRE is actually holding in there better than the rest of the banking sector. So if you take a look at KRE on the regional bank ETF side, you're actually hanging in there better than XLF is, in my opinion. Now, this uh, 59.38 level was breached, but just watch the sector because there might be something to this. Usually when you go through these kinds of periods of time, people start looking for growth. As they look for growth, they get growth through acquisitions. So you might see something like this hold, and I do think it's pertinent to just kind of take a look at where we were during the uh, in the, the boom that took place uh, in 07 in real estate and, and say, wow, you know, we're still not at that level, un unlike the XLF. And that's that's pretty pertinent. And I think that's something we should be paying attention to. Now, if you look at EEM, which is the Emerging Market Index, you can just see that you are just in complete, utter free fall. And that's something that you need to take into account as well. OK, these are things that you're just going to want to keep an eye on and pay attention to. And we're going to get into some other names in a moment. I want to start doing some of the proprietary stuff. But you have to get an understanding, like even healthcare they sold closing at the low. So when they come for everything, nothing will be safe when this goes on. Now, Meta is a great example. Meta will never see this level ever again. It will never see 385 ever. Um, they're talking about hiring freezes and what's going on out there. 137.10 was our target. Uh, you know, we've been shorting this one in the trading community for some time now. And now you're at 137.10 and you're going to 1, 123. I mean, I hate to sound that specific, but you're getting to that 123 level. Now, Berkshire, always look at Berkshire because it tells you what's going on with the value names. And I'm going to show you a, a quick way to look at growth versus value uh, in a moment here. But you see this right here, you're setting up a bear flag and this is starting to turn. So maybe the value names are going to hold, but we're going to have to keep an eye on Berkshire. I don't see anything redeeming about it. You're not at sell levels yet, but you do want to watch this particular pattern. I would become concerned if I was a Berkshire seller or investor and I broke that 261.55 level. Euro US dollar. So if you take a look at this exchange and how it's going, you can just see how the euro has been dropping against the dollar and now has broken that parity level. Finally, this is still the 10 month yellow moving average. And you can see very clearly here, when was the last time that we were really below parity? was 1999 and 2000. There are a lot of similarities between what is going on now and then as well. So I find this interesting that this is going on and that you're down at these same levels, but this does not bode well uh, for the US stock market until this starts to find some kind of common ground and can start rallying. There's a lot of lot of moving parts to this, but you should be looking at this because it, it, it is a global issue uh, and right now we're really in one big trade. If you look at the US dollar, the US dollar since 2021, since they started printing, it's just been on absolute fire. You can see your complete flag right here and then you broke out 
and just look at what we've done over since May. I mean, you're up dramatically. So this is an enormous move, just so you understand. For the dollar, if you were the beginning of June to now, just owning the dollar is up 13%. Right. And if you overlay this with the S&P right now, it's very clear that you're in one big macro trade. So you want to see how this goes. Do I think we're going to head back to these levels? No. But you, you see the similarities. This is right. This is during the dot com bust. And now look where we are now. So where could we get to on the dollar? You might be able to get back to that level. And that's something that we have to consider. Uh, make sure that you remember that there is a link in description for these charts and these slides so that you're able to take a look at them. And please comment on the video and this format because what we're going to go through here is pretty timely. Now, this is British pound versus US dollar. Why is this important? Well, this is why the UK did what they did yesterday. And this is why I wanted to start doing some more macro data. So when you're staring at your chart and you see some kind of quote, buy signal on the market on Wednesday, you can understand what's really going on behind the hood because you're basically stepping on a time bomb if you don't understand this stuff. It's one big trade right now and it's macro. So as you're starting to come down, you can see you broke right here. This is when they intervened. And even that intervention, it did get the uh, the, the pound up, but not not to any great extent. So you still have an issue. You're not at that 1985 level but you're, you're down here and you, you have some issues. So this needs to rally, we, right? We need this to get strong against the dollar uh, and that will help the US stock market. Now, if you just look at the UK 100 and just focus this, I'm gonna use the five years and just focus on what's going on, what just happened, right? We just broke, this just is starting to break. So is this going to continue down or not? We're gonna to have to watch it. But if this continues to roll right here and is unable to go up, well, you might head back down because this is really this has not really done that yet. You might start heading back towards those pandemic levels. You're starting to turn here and your 10 is starting to curl. It's not what you want to see at all. Now, if you look at some of the you know, further out stock markets, I found this fascinating looking at it. And I think it's important to understand anyone that's exporting right now and is not tied to anything going on with Russia, Ukraine, obviously this is Brazil, they're doing okay. They're hanging in there. So you have those exports. We've, I tried trading PBR a couple times. You, you have some issues going on there that make it a little difficult, but this is actually working and actually setting up. And I think this is something should be on your radar. Now, how you play that, whether you do it through an ETF, I'm gonna leave that up to you. But I have a, a, 10, a 10 month that's curling up. And I'm not so sure how many charts I have shown you today where you have a 10 month curling up unless it was a bond yield, right? Other than that, we really haven't seen it. You might wanna pay attention to what's going on in some of these emerging markets that are not dealing with the sanction issues that are benefiting from the sanction issues, right? That might be something to pay attention to. This is an interesting graph that I use. So this is gold divided by the 20 year bond. And what this does is just give you a sense of what's going on and how gold is performing with the 20 year bond. Now, if you wanna get uh, more specific, you can see how this is setting up for gold, uh, you know, and this to break out. Let me just give you these examples. So what this is showing in the orange is this is gold. You can see how gold is significantly higher. I went back to 2005, does not really matter where we go. We'll go back to 2008 and you can see how gold is up here and the 20 year is down there. Now, take that off and you can see how gold is continuing and setting up to outperform over the 20 year. What does this tell you? Go back to our gold chart. Would you rather buy bonds right now or would you rather buy gold? This chart is telling you what you should be doing, right? So in other words, by understanding this, and you could use this yourself, uh, it depends on your system. This I'm using TradingView and all I'm doing here is dividing gold by the 20 year bond over a monthly in creating my own little chart, my own little system. And you can see this very clearly and you just saw me overlay those two numbers and you can see how this is performing. So when you're thinking, do I buy gold? Do I buy bonds? Don't guess, use empirical data. You'll find it a lot, a lot more helpful. New York Stock Exchange composite, we've broken 
we look like we're heading lower, but you do have a level right here that is worth noting. So you have sliced through two support levels, but you do have a lot going on in this one particular area, and I really wouldn't rule that out. So when you see that you have some kind of supply in an area, you just kind of want to pay attention to that. And you have a supply right in here and you're in there. So can we get to that area and hold? It's possible. And I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't rule out a, a flush of some kind and then maybe a rebuild. But I, I do think we need some kind of flush to reset here. As I said, we're going to be going through a lot today uh, in a very short period of time so we can get a sense of what I do. I run through about a thousand charts uh, at the end of every month, every quarter, and I'm only going through the ones that I think are most pertinent or most interesting. So I'm just going to clean all these lines off very quickly. And we're looking at Bitcoin futures. This sure looks like a bear flag to me. Now you have this doji. You didn't close it that low, but this makes it very clear what you should be focused on. So if you break this doji, it's on. So 18,000, you need to hold 18,000 here. If you don't hold 18,000, Bitcoin's going lower. I think that's very clear by looking at this. Uh, you, you might see people get sick of the currencies a little bit and start diversifying out into this, but you're only going to diversify out in the currency until you see something like this, right? Until you realize that you could lose 20% in a currency and then you look at the US dollar that's up. So when you start seeing things like that, do you really want to be buying Bitcoin? The NASDAQ 100, just to review, take a look at where you're at. This is just the NDX 100, top 100 names, most owned by hedge funds. That's a bear flag. You got right to our 10 month, you rejected. You're right here. This is support. This is major support that you're sitting on right here. It doesn't get any clearer. Okay, You're closed right on major support. Now, you've only rejected that once in September. Now you're here again. You held it once before. If you crack this level, there's not much below you, right? So if you crack there in the NDX, you're heading to this 10,162. So if you crack here and you take out a new low on the NDX, you have to assume that you're looking at about another, at least another 6.5% drop on it, something to consider, something to, to think about. Uh, and this is the SPY versus gold. So in other words, what this is going to tell you is how is the SPY performing the S&P versus gold. Now, if you overlay the SPY with gold. Now here's the SPY is in orange, gold is in blue. You can see which one has been outperforming since 2010, it's not even close. So this, this is basically just showing you that outperformance. What I find interesting is that you're having a hard time getting above that 10 month moving average, which might signify that the, the under performance of gold may be coming to an end versus the S&P. Now, what's fascinating about that is gold is in blue. And you can see since 2021, November, when we started having inflation issues, you can see that gold is actually outperforming us right now, which is somewhat interesting, right? So that does fit with what we saw here on the monthly chart. And it's something that we just, just keep in mind as something that maybe we should be paying attention to, right? Maybe that gold issue that we looked at earlier at Newmont Mining, maybe long-term they're watched out. Again, we're looking at these charts over multiple months and years. We're not talking about buying it on a Tuesday. We're just talking about what's going on out there and trying to come up with a game plan. Copper futures have just completely imploded. I know a lot of people are out there trying to play FCX and some of these names. I, I would just say to be really careful. This is very clearly forming some kind of double top, breaks out, tries to get over that double top right here, straight across that four and three quarters, tried to break, reversal. This 10 month moving average is obviously pointing straight down. That's not ideal. Here's the US dollar versus the Japanese yen. Well, we know what's going on here and we know the complete outperformance of the US dollar, right? So as the US dollar is just outperforming and the yen is really not, to say the least, you're going to see moves like this. Now, you, what you want to do is go, OK, well, how realistic is this to continue? And you want to kind of focus on this and you really kind of want to look at where what's going on with the Nikkei and see if there's something that you could do there about it. Right. So if you take a look at this and you realize you go from 2007 coming across and how you're breaking out. So you're breaking out 
And you're going to just have to start looking at these other levels on the US dollar and Japanese yen and try to figure out what to do here. Well, you have some levels coming up here that you could break. You're going into multi-decade highs if you start getting through the one, you know, the 135 you're already through, you start looking at the 147. Now, what's fascinating about this is here's the Nikkei. And look at how the Nikkei is performing. So you're not even, you're, you're not hardly doing anything. This is just the futures market of the Nikkei 225. And you can see your wedge line right here. You're, we're not dealing with anything compared to what we're dealing with right now uh, in, you know, over here in the US. So this is an interesting market that might have something that we might, that we might wanna look at. Now, this is a proprietary indicator, but again, I'm just going to walk you through how to do it. You just take the Nikkei futures, you divide them by the SPY. Very simple. This one will actually be in the bottom because this one's pertinent and I want to focus on it. See this? They're all pertinent, but this is very interesting. So here's my undercut. We all know that undercut. We all know what's going on here. And now look, we have a 10 month that's pointing up. So this is so if you're going to ask yourself a question, who's going to outperform? Is the Japanese market going to outperform the U.S. market? Right now, the answer is there's the possibility that that may happen. And that's something that we should probably consider. And we might want to be looking at stocks or, ETF, or ETFs that are over there. So this is comparing consumer discretionary retail versus your consumer staples, your Clorox, XLY versus XLP. And what we're seeing is we've been seeing this since 2009, just complete outperformance, right? Now that outperformance is starting to go away. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that money is going to XLP. But when we looked at XLP, we started to see that come in. Well, I think it's, it's important to note that if you look at what happened with this particular equation, you never got through, but you also didn't take out lows. So maybe XLY is starting to get a little tired. Right, so we could look at this and maybe XLY is getting a little tired in regards to XLP. Maybe that's why money's coming out of XLP. Maybe it's setting up to go with the consumer discretionary going into the holiday season, which is usually a pretty big shopping season. So maybe we wanna look at XLY uh, as they start blowing out of XLP. Even though this is not performing at the same level, you're still in an uptrend. You just have this 10 month that's down and you're still not taking out lows as some of the other indexes are. Now, this is the 30 year treasury and you can see this treasury yield and what's going on with it. Now you're at this 37.65. And if you come straight across right here, you can see that level. It's just screaming. Just look, look right at it. Let me just mark that off so you can see where you're at. Right. So you broke that 34.27. Now you're above. And this is a monthly close. This is why it's so important. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit here. This is why it's so important to understand this. You broke your DTL and now you have confirmation by closing above it. One tick above it's confirmation, you're, go you're golden. So this is pretty clear, right? You're seeing these yields and you're watching these 10 years rally and you're watching these 10 months rally. So we saw this in the 10 year and we're seeing it here. They're buying bonds, right? They're, buy they're buying bonds. Let's see how long it lasts. I you know, we saw them come in a little bit, right? We did see them come in. I just don't, I don't know that, that what we saw here, let's just zoom in on this. What we saw, I don't know that that's going to be enough. I, I really don't. So this is a 10 day real quick. I just want to zoom in. This is what UK did, right? This is what happened to the UK when, when the UK did what they did, right? So they, they come out, they make a bond buying statement and all of a sudden everybody just buys the 30 year. Well, they're buying bonds, okay? Now they're buying bonds. But when you go back and take a look at this for a month, what do you have? Right? You have massive, massive dumping. So basically, people that are looking at the daily are looking at a, you know, a flea on a gnat in comparison to what's going on out there. Uh, Ethereum, it's probably worth just noting this is the most perpetual contract I could find that had the most amount of value. And I just want to point this out. You're not cracking like Bitcoin is. If I had to pick one of these out of the two of them, this is the one that I would lean towards. There is zero redeeming about this chart. This is an H. I don't see how this doesn't completely break down and get back down to these November levels. Uh, I, I just don't see how that's even remotely possible for that to hold on to. 
So this is the value line geometric index. Pull this down here. This is used as a gauge of value of a specific stock over a specific period in time. So if you are under a certain level, essentially what it's saying is that stock does not have the same value. For example, what this could be saying to somebody, depending on how they want to interpret it, if a stock was here and here and it's in this index, that stock now has less value than it did in 1998. The, the larger issue with this is that you're breaking resistance. So here is old resistance, right? Old resistance, right? Becomes what? Support, support, right? Support breaks becomes what? Resistance. It's not what you want to see. It's not where you want to be because it's telling you that the value of the underlying assets, there's about 1,700 names in here. They're telling you it's coming in. If you overlay something like this with the spot, you can see pretty clearly it mimics exactly what's going on. You could actually argue a little bit that it's going to almost lead what happens with the S&P. The S&P is obviously in orange. This is interesting. This is a Renaissance IPO ETF. They invest in IPOs. I look at this because it tells you the health of, we'll refer to it as even the SPAC market and what's going on out there right now, right? Something that we just kind of want to always know what's going on, how the health of the markets. This is basically just a dumpster fire from, from when you started the beginning of November all the way down. I, I see no sign out there whatsoever. This past week or two weeks ago, you had Chamath uh, unwind two SPACs or beginning to unwind two SPACs. There's something like 500 SPACs out there that are looking for uh, deals and no company wants to go public. No, no private company that's doing well right now is saying, I need to be in the public market because of what's going on out there. So I don't really foresee this going anywhere, but this is a great metric to use to understand how strong the IPO market is, right? So here you could see that you had a very strong IPO market. Here you can see that you do not have a very strong one. Let me know that you find this helpful and what parts of it you find helpful. Uh, th that'll be huge for me in doing this going forward. I think once a month to do this and have a barometer that you can use for that month, for that quarter, at least for a month is good. So what I do is I take the Nikkei and I just divide it by Toyota. Everybody does this, it's like an old trick. You just wanna make sure that the Nikkei is outperforming the, the car manufacturers, which of course it is. And so that would tell you again and give us another signal that, hey, maybe we need to look at Japan and what's going on over there, right? And this is just the core commodity index of all the commodities that are outstanding including crude oil. Now, what's interesting about this is it cracked for the first time. It has not cracked since the pandemic, right? So now we're cracking. So that is a data point. Now, what is that data point telling us? Well, commodities go up during inflationary times. Commodities go up during inflationary times. So if this is cracking and commodity prices are coming down. That bodes well for the stock market even though the, technically it doesn't look that great right now. And that's something that we need to take into account. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be great. When you had the, uh, when you had the great financial crisis, everything crashed because things were going to be considerably weak. But if commodity prices get weaker, it's because inflation is coming in. Inflation was not overly our issue back here. This was just bad financial products uh, that were just not being regulated. And if you come back and look here, in 99 and 01, you can see something very similar where you pulled back and then you just started to move higher. Same thing could happen right here. And I, I would keep an eye on that. I think that's very pertinent information to watch. This is just the Europe 600. You can see already you're just riding that 10 month down and we're always going to use a 10 month in our charts now. And you closed at a low. So with where this is, with where we showed you where European banks are and what they have going out on over there, we looked at the DAX and saw that the DAX looks weak. You know, they, they might be areas of weakness that may persist going into the winter and areas that we might want to look at. You may want to look at something like we looked at earlier, right, where we looked at Brazil, where we're looking at Japan. Maybe there's some names over there that, that, we, could be, that could, we could benefit from. Gas exploration, you want to see what's going on here, just so you understand where you are in the pecking order. You took out that pandemic low, tried right here, right? Took it out once and then that was it. Now what? 
you're just sitting right on that 10 month. You're just sitting there. There's nothing really here that's exciting. You're in that middle space. So these are not really the names that I'd be going crazy about right now. Okay, so you're going to want to remember this one. This is VUG divided by VTV. Okay, VUG is growth, VTV is value. So what you have, and if you just go back, let's just go all the way back. You had growth versus value since 2005, since these came out at all time highs. You, one would even say it's a double top. See, I undercut there and now you're undercutting right here. That's why looking at these monthlies is so important. So growth is out. Value is coming back in vogue. This was too high. So what you'd have to do is see if you're going to get to some median level. So right now, you could actually still argue that growth is still overvalued. You're not really near any median and you were up here. So you might start seeing them pick through the bones a little bit first and buy some value names. And value is something that we can discuss how to, you know, where to go and what to say what is value, what is, you know, what is growth. Uh, but very simply, you just drill in the VTV and see what names are in there and VUG and see what names are in there. But the point being that this is telling you very clearly you have a double top and that growth is not setting up to outperform value right now. So that means that we should probably be looking at some of those names. And this is just the the entire world country index, not including the US. Always interesting to see. So we kind of we, you know, we get so caught up in our own world. But if you take a look at this, very clear what's going on there. Very clear, right? Nobody really wants to own anything that's going on out there. So stay out of the way. It's what I've been saying in the trading room for weeks now. I think they're sick of me saying it. And let's just get into the Mexico index. You can see how you just tried to rally up and you pulled all the way back. A couple more here I want to go through real quick. Just the S&P one month. I just want to show you this in regards to the actual futures. Again, you broke down, you rallied right up to that, what, 10 month moving average, you broke down, you're sitting right on support. Okay, you're sitting right on it. If you crack this level, you're going to have a problem. And it's definitely something that you're going to want to focus on. And we're just going to wrap up with this chart right here. And I just want to walk through this very, very quickly here. So if you look at these levels, okay, we're not going to go anywhere. If you overlay this chart, and you overlay this with two things. Let's overlay this with the SPY just to start there, okay? So if you overlay this with just the SPY, it's exact, right? So where did we peak? Okay, and then what happened? Then we rolled over. So until that happens, there's nothing that we're gonna be able to do about it. Until the euro gets stronger, the dollar, right, is gonna be strong. As the dollar is strong, and the euro is weaker, our markets are going to come in. It's one big macro trade. If you overlay this, even with something like, take the 10 year, which inflation is a larger issue, but the 10 year, look at the 10 year in regards to the euro. Okay, there's a reason why I do this every month. This is this is glaring, it's, it's like an enantiomer, it's like looking in the mirror. So something to think about, let me know, comment on this, let me know that you found it helpful. If you didn't find it helpful, uh, I tried to get this down to about an hour. It was actually a lot longer, but please comment. Please let me know what you found helpful. I will put slides out there uh, with some notes so that you can look at this and we'll go from there. If you are interested in the trading room, en enrollment is open right now. There will be a link up here in the top right. Everybody have a great weekend and a strong fourth quarter and trade to win on Monday.